All right. Yeah, so as was already mentioned, I'm, I'm sort of here because I wrote a book on writing a few years back. And I wrote a book on writing a few years back because I had written a series of blog posts on writing a few years back. And I have written a series of blog posts on writing a few years back because I kind of wanted to get some sense into the process of writing. I was sort of struggling with helping my students to write. That was a starting point. That, and when I had a PhD student who, who should start their first or second paper, then I didn't have very much to give them other than, yeah, start writing the papers, mimic them, you know, there's an intro and then there's, there's results and all that. But I couldn't really teach them. And that was kind of bugging me. And at the same time, I often myself found myself in a situation where it was rather difficult to write something. I couldn't, I couldn't really figure out what's, what's the issue here. Why does it take so much time? And then I kind of thought of this. I read a lot of literature and started, started to come up with some kind of a process, one possible process of writing. So I go through these steps and then do this, then do that, and then, then eventually you get that. And the key to this process is kind of realizing that it's difficult to write if you don't know what to write. Now, this may sound a bit like trivial and stupid, but then if you disentangle these two things that, that don't start to write before you know what to write, then this sort of leads somewhere, as I will, I will show you. Um, very good. Before that, uh, let me do a quick poll. So, how many of you have Oh, okay, let's, let's start this way. How many of you are PhD students? Almost all. Any postdocs? Some. Okay. Um, how many of you have already written one like first author paper where you did the right? Most, but not every. Okay, very good. So we are, this is exactly the right audience because for, for those who are starting to write, writing their first papers, this, this, should, this has been kind of developed for for people at this stage. Great. So let's get started with the problem of writing and let's let's start with an example of, of why why writing sometimes uh, doesn't go as it should. So um, I wonder how many of you have been in this situation. I have been in this situation like a number of times and that's why I'm now using it as an example of what not to do. You have a paper to write, you fire up your latex editor. And then you look at the screen. And then you look at the screen. And you go, oh, words are not coming. It feels painful, it feels bad. You really sort of struggle to get the first word, the first sentence there. So there is this, it's not a blank piece of paper anymore, but it's a blank latex editor's screen that is, it's, yeah, words are not coming and it feels bad. And one of my, at least personally, my biggest realization was that in a situation like this, I started thinking about, okay, where does this feel bad? Because just like if I, if I, if I hit my toe and my nerves send a signal to my brain that, that this hurts, then that signal has meaning. So it tells that something is wrong with my toe. Now, if you are in, a, in this situation that you start to write and it feels like oh, this hurts, that's also, there's a message. So it hurts for a reason. And I started thinking about this reason and, and sort of tried to dissect that into, into a number of, of components. And there are many actually here in this situation. Now, this is one of the main problems of writing and one of the main problems of inexperienced writers that, that um, we try to solve a gazillion of problems at the same time. So if, if you just, if your first thing that you do when you start writing a paper, maybe you have some figures, that's that, but maybe you have some results, but then you just sort of open your editor. It's this that you try to solve these micro level issues together with all those macro level issues at the same time. So in order to write a word, you should know what word to use, but to choose the right words, you should know what the sentence should do, what, what's the sentence about. To know what the sentence is about, you should know what the paragraph is about. So what sort of information am, am I trying to convey in this paragraph? If you are writing the intro of the paper, this is difficult if you don't know what the whole intro is about. So what's the flow? Where do you start? Where do you go? Where do you end? 
And you can't do this well unless you really know what your whole paper is about. Because if you, as I write in the introduction, it's difficult to do unless you know where to focus. What, what, what should be the point of the introduction? Where should you lead your reader? And trying to sort out all these at once, at the same time, is impossible. This is my, my thesis here. And that's why one should start from the end, from the biggest top level issues, and only then gradually work down towards the, the uh, sentence and word level things. So in one sentence, how to write a paper, my answer is from top down with planning and thinking. So first think and then write. First decide and then write about what you have just decided. Um, if you split this idea into sort of compartments or a process chart or a flow, then roughly I'm going to today follow this, this uh, system, this approach here, where first we spend some time on talking about how to develop the story of your paper, how to, how to choose what the paper is about, what message it should uh, bring. Then we'll talk about a bit finer details, like once we know this, once we know the story, then how to, how to basically uh, put that story in the form of a paper with the usual sections, starting with introduction, ending with discussion, how to plan those sections, what goes in and how to, how to, how to kind of create an outline that helps you write in the end. And you only start writing somewhere here, so you, you, don't, you don't begin with writing words, you begin with planning. And then once it's done, then there are some, some small things left. But let's start at the, at the beginning. So, developing the story of the paper. I'm using the word story in a way that um, I'm not talking about fictional stories, as you know, paper should not be fiction, you should not write, invent things uh, that, are, that are fictional for your papers, but there should be some sort of a story, an arc, that the readers can follow, that begins with a question and ends with an answer to that, that question. And this is the starting point. Before you write the paper, you decide what your paper is about. And you try to express this in a couple of sentences. Um, if you have very many results at hand, which sometimes happens, you do a lot of analysis, you have analyzed the data set, you have 15 figures, um, and you should now write a paper about that. So how to deal with this? Pick the best result, sort of shape the other results around it, or if you can't avoid it, uh, make the point of the paper to be the synthesis of these 15 figures or something, but you will need to somehow express this point of your paper in a few sentences. If you can do this, it's extremely helpful. It's kind of compression of, of information. And this is kind of not at all about shallowness because you could think that, okay, should I then just tweet my papers? That's just a single tweet, uh, not, not like that. If you think of many of the key scientific results and ideas, they are like this, that you can express them in a few sentences. Um, you have space time, it's curved by mass. Um, if we think of some of the early complex network literature, uh, there's preferential attachment, that's why we have scale freeness. That's a paper with thousands and thousands of citations. Um, or another, which, which should I pick another sort of um, key complex networks. Okay, if you have scale free networks, then you have zero epidemic threshold. That's another paper, very famous paper. So, good papers deliver a point. They don't try to sort out all the problems of the world, but they try to answer some specific question or make some specific point. And once you have decided this point, it's easier to write the paper because you now you kind of know the target. If you have decided your point, then the rest of the paper is simply making this point credible so that you show evidence that this is true, it's correct, this is what, what really happens out there in the world. It will also be easier to read this paper because as a reader, this point will, you will see it in the abstract, you know, oh, okay, this is what this paper is about, now I just sort of 
follow it and I already know where it's going instead of having to sort of wonder at the beginning that where does this all lead and it's also easier to market the paper using the word market maybe maybe in a sort of very loose way um, for example if now suppose that there are there are two papers one that has a very crisp point and one that requires 50 word, 50 sentences to explain and if you talk to your a friend of yours or a colleague that hey did you spot this paper on the archive today that did x and now if x is five words or x is 100 words which one is going to kind of catch which which message will be more contagious um yeah because ideas are contagious they travel through networks as, as all complexity scientists should know and if those ideas can be expressed so that they are transmitted intact through the network links and are easy to grasp then that happens better so really really important choose the point of your paper before you start writing yes so maybe I was wondering about this question a bit different way. But what's the earliest point when European should aim to choose that <laughs> well, okay, let's let's theory and practice are two different things here. Now, in the world that 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 um, uh, say all grant agencies expect, we should know the point five years ago. So we make a research plan that we will discover X in five years, and we know it all the way. In reality, when you start working on something, you don't know this point yet. Probably, you may you may have good hunches. So sometimes there is a good guess, and then you work towards it, and then it's realized. Uh, still you have some sort of direction right because it's it's very hard to work aimlessly that i just try this that and that so so it's kind of when you start your work towards your paper it's sort of in between it's it's kind of a quantum thing the waveform hasn't collapsed yet you haven't really measured it yet but there are possibilities out there so one of them will be realized in the end and then when you start to write the paper then you should be at the stage where you can actually actually decide this somehow so you have enough material at hand that you can think what to make the key point of the paper. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you will actually need an iteration where you start writing and you realize that stuff is missing. It's not really working. I need to do something more or I need to change. But at least you should make an attempt at this point. And I will come to this shortly. The abstract of the paper, that's really like the acid test of this. If you don't have, if you don't know the point, you can't write an abstract. Therefore, next thing is you write the abstract that's that's part of part of the plan here second how do you do this and that's also i mean that's really depends on how your group works and how how you work with your supervisor and all that um my such a, su suggestion would be that if you have a bunch of results and you need to pick your key point don't do that alone try to decide together with the group with your supervisor try to talk with people about this try to go through alternatives because that often makes it easier it's easier to see if something works if you try to explain it to someone like your colleague or supervisor so so do this together good any further comments at this stage okay then before we go to the abstract then what else now your your paper should be about your key point you should have results that kind of make make it clear that this key point is correct but very often that you have results and you have sort of a freedom to, to decide what to put in and then uh, what helps with your choice is to realize that um, that results may serve different purposes the plots of your paper may serve different purposes and you can decide on those purposes and you can plan according to those purposes the metaphor i often use here is something like a film script where you have where you have different parts that serve different purposes so so if you look at the sort of i don't know traditional hollywood style movie film scripts first you have something that's like the setup where you where you learn the world the characters you know what this film is about uh, in a rather short period of time my I, I think a very good example here would be star wars a new hope in the first couple of minutes there's a rebel spaceship there's an imperial star destroyer there's darth vader and he's a badass 
you, you have all the characters in a couple of minutes except Luke Skywalker and then it sort of goes on from there. So you have a short period where you immerse the reader for the paper where you immerse the reader to your work and that will of course involve the the introduction and the literature review and all that but it may also involve some of the results that that you have i'll come to that in a bit then in the film script you have sort of increasing drama increasing action and in the end the conflict is resolved the death star explodes or something and then there's a outworking of the story that doesn't really take that much time typically now if if you sort of if you use this scheme for your results then you might have something like this that you start with results that provide setting now for any project where you have a lot of data analysis where, where you have a data set that you study or 10 data sets that you study or anything like that this is typically where you need to start you need to provide some statistics some some kind of key things about those those data sets that are not necessarily the result itself or not not terribly important on their own but rather they let the reader understand what we are dealing with here so it's it's the setup of the story you don't always need results like that for a paper but sometimes you do and then you can either directly somehow show your key result or very often you kind of build your story up to your key result through some some auxiliary results that you combine or by showing very, very typical example would be that that you show that there's something weird in my data that present theories do not explain and therefore i'll now set out to explain it and then you'll have the key results later so some results that kind of point out that there's a problem or are building blocks for the key result then there's the key result it could be a single plot it could be a couple of them and then that's a technique that, that I know some, some of the big names in the field tend to use that, that you add in results in the end that are sort of just demonstrating the meaning or the usefulness of the main result. A bit like application of the thing that are not necessarily very important on their own. They are more like not schematics, but examples that yes, I figured out this. Now look what you could do with that. And then some examples. So some sort of results that, that are like the epilogue of the paper. So this is one way of, of shaping your results. You can, there, there, there must be others there. There must be several ways, but the key thing here is that you think of a role for your results in the story that your paper, paper has such that the key result is the thing the point of the paper is really visible and if you have results that don't play a part in this story then toss them out put them to the si or something else don't don't force your paper to have results that are not necessary this is something that first time writers often have difficulties with because you if you have done 15 plots then you spend time on all of them and it kind of feels like they should go somewhere and it's it feels very bad to just let go of some of them and not put them in 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 your paper but believe me it's for the best because because it's much easier to read and understand a paper that has that has uh, the right number of results not an overflow of results write another paper if you have very many plots good any comments or questions about about this at this stage okay now now to what i already warned you about the acid test of of the story now suppose that we are at this stage where we really have chosen what the paper should be about its point and we have chosen what goes in all the results all the plots or at least have some sort of a fairly good idea of those now let's try to write this up so before writing the paper or before even planning the paper a typical step in my process is that now it's the time to write the abstract very many people find that this is weird or that this is this is never done this way you write the abstract when the paper is done and then you go and you write the abstract about the paper i always try to do it the other way around because i've i've really seen that this helps at least me as a writer if i myself write the paper 
this makes it so much faster that I first spend a couple of days even on the abstract. And then I understand that, okay, this is what my paper is about. And this is, this is its meaning. So yes, once you've done this, you, you realize that it's, it's a very good, good thing to do. And really the abstract is your paper in a very condensed form. And in addition to your results, it now also has the context, because that's what a typical abstract will go to that next. It has the context and it has the implications. So it's a bit broader than, than just the key result and what results go in. It kind of completes the story by telling why all this would matter. So how to do this? How, how to structure the abstract? You can do that in many ways and it depends on the journal and depends on what, what's the sort of common abstract length for the journal. Um, we always, in my group, we always start with this structure, which is like an hourglass, which is typically what abstracts are like anyway. So you start with the broad setting. What are we talking about here? What's the domain of science or what's the field field or what, what's, what, what's the sort of, yeah, what kind of problems are we dealing with here? Now, this is of course a bit different from depending on the journal. So if you, I don't know, if you write, write to applied network science, you don't need to tell what network science is about, but if you try a paper to get the paper in some sort of more, I don't know, PNAS, you need to start a bit higher. But you need to start with the broad setting anyway. This is kind of the setting. That's that's the first three minutes of Star Wars. So what's what's going on here? What's what's the world? What what are the conflicts in this world? What it is? What is it that we are set out to solve? And then you move closer to your research question, the key point of your paper. And then finally you state that question. And this is a very good exercise. So what exact problem did you set out to solve? And this is something that over and over again, even with very experienced people, even in the sort of science that, 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 that sometimes that us seniors to do together, at this stage we find that I'm not sure what was actually the question. That, what did we try to sort out? What's, what, what's the real research problem here? Because sometimes it kind of gets lost when you get so many, you do so many calculations, you analyze so many sets of data and it kind of gets lost there. So it's very good to go here at this stage to go back to that. What is the problem that we are trying to solve? And then how did you solve it? So what, what was the outcome? And then what, how is the world now a better place because you solved it? So what, what consequences does this solution of yours have? And then even, even more broadly, uh, than, than in your immediate sort of field of science, what, what things can follow from your abstract. And it's actually really not, this, this um, form is really not like unique, it's, it's used everywhere. And actually, if uh, most of us are not like writing nature papers on a daily or weekly or even a yearly basis, but if, if we would, then we would have to write it this way because that's in their rules. So if you want to submit to nature, they have a strict script for the abstract that you have to follow sentence level. Otherwise you are desk rejected that you didn't follow the rules. And, you, and if you then analyze what this, this script of theirs is, is exactly the same. So first you have one to two sentences that provide a basic introduction to the field comprehensible to any scientist in any discipline. So they, they are a journal that with wide readership, they want to start broad. And then we we'll go to more details, two or three sentences of more detail and so on and so on. So this is really what you have to do for, to write uh, a nature or, or to submit a nature paper. But this is such a good form that, that I would highly recommend everyone to try to use this maybe with modifications depending on your, on your journal for every single abstract. Because if, if you write an abstract that follows this logic, it can't fail. It has the right elements in there. It will be good. And it will force you to think about the question, your solution and the broader context. 
So why did you, why are you doing the thing you are doing and what follows from it? So this is a very good, very good exercise. And really every single time I nowadays write the paper, I start with this or every single time one of the students starts a, writes a paper, we, we really start with this, but write this first and then we'll proceed. Now, the, the help you get from this is it will become clear when we look at the introduction, for example, but it is that the rest of the thing is just expanding this. This is your paper. It's, it's, it's essence is here. You have written it. It's 20, 10, 20, 30 sentences long. And now just expand it. That's your paper. It makes your life so much easier when you've done this first. Good. There's another sort of more difficult thing that one should try to do, one typically tries to do at this stage. Honestly, this is a nightmare. That's the title of the paper. If, if anything is difficult for me, it's this. I hate it. I hate to come up with the title for a paper because this is extremely difficult in my view. Uh, very often, I mean, at this stage, we have a working title, and then before submission, some come, someone comes up with a more decent title. And so this is something that gets keeps iterating through the process of writing the paper. And but why is it so difficult? It's because, I mean, because the title should be this, and it shouldn't be this. It should be that, but it shouldn't be that. You have all these conflicting requirements that you should have a short title. There are even papers that show that papers with short titles are cited more. But then it should be informative. It's stupid to have a title that doesn't really tell about the content of the paper. But if it's informative, then you need to use many words. So you should use few words and many words at the same time. What a pain. Um, then you should have, you should have, you should use words that are sort of comprehensible to anyone. So it's, it's uh, I hate titles that I don't understand. So writers should use words that I understand. But on the other hand, this is sort of about searchability and indexability and all that. So maybe you should actually use these more narrow keywords. So you should not use narrow keywords and you should use narrow keywords. And then you should have a title that's kind of catchy. That's easy to remember, but it shouldn't be stupid. It shouldn't be sort of ridiculous. So everything at the same time, conflict and requirements is difficult. Um, but still, sometimes people succeed in that. And, and here I want to do a little poll. So I picked randomly from, from one nature, uh, issue of nature this year, a couple of, couple of uh, example titles. Can you see them even in the back? Should I read them? You can see it. Okay, so audience comments, we spent a couple of, a couple of minutes reading them and which of them are good in your view? What, what, what of, which of them work well? So let, let me let me hear from you. Any comments already? I like the tiny yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I love it. And it's sort of just tiny. I mean, who, who could not love tiny beetles and flying? So it's yes, perfect. It's easy to understand. It's somehow, yes. It's, in my view, that's also, you, you can't have a better title than this. It tells about the result. It tells about what you study, which is the tiny beetles flight and all that. So everything is in a single single sentence. It's, it's just beautiful. Unfortunately, not every time your science is such that you can, it's, this is not doable every time. So don't take this as the standard where you should aim at because you will not be able to do this every time. But still, it's super good. Any other comments? It's weird for me to include a number on a title like Yes, um, I, I agree with you. Or like, I don't like much words. <laughs> And the difference with the first one that actually has this redshift and has these numbers is also that it is it is about 
that's, that the title is the topic. It's not the result. The tiny beetles thing tells the result, right? But that's the topic of study. So this is what they study. And I think this is probably, I mean, if you are a cosmologist, then yes, this is exactly what we study 3.34 for, for, for redshift. Yes, that's what we want to do. Everyone else is like, what? Yeah. And it's a nature paper. It should be comprehensible to everyone. So they didn't follow their own rules there, I guess. But so, yeah, that's not a very good title in my view. The beetle one is good. Uh, then the malaria thing, it's sort of, it has more difficult words than the beetle thing, but kind of it's the same, that it tells a result, that something depends on, on something. And which is also the, the, the fourth one, and that's absolutely incomprehensible unless you know immunology. I've done some of it, so I understand this is a good title for immunologists, but as a general title, it really sucks because, because you will never be able to understand what all this means. There are words there that take like one paragraph at least to explain, and even then that's difficult. So it's this really jargon. And then the physics title, the fifth one, again, it's like a topic, right? It's not the result. It's, it tells what they study, which kind of, I haven't read the paper, but to me that would implicate that, okay, so if you don't give out the result, so that means that this paper is about everything in there. So. So domain wall dynamics, after reading this paper, you know it, you know everything that there is about domain wall dynamics in both instances, which again makes these titles not that good, unless for that specific field, if it has been like a long standing problem that everyone knows that if you write the paper with this title, then you've solved something. So it might work, but. Yeah, I like the last one, because there are two reasons to measure it, key domain, and okay, correct. Yes, fine, fine. Yes, yes. So it's info again, it, this depends on your level of knowledge, right? So it's really informative if you know these things. And and for 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 PRL in that field or anything, that's probably absolutely perfect. For a sort of more broader readership, a bit more difficult. But. Good. Okay. But some yes. So now, now you know how other titles look like, and then you may kind of think, consider the same when you write your own paper's title, that how would this look like to someone who, who doesn't really know all the things I do. And if possible, if you can, I think this is a good idea, if you can make the title to be the result, try it. It's not always doable, but it seems to work universally, but it's, that it's, it's uh, useful. And this really, if you have done what we started with, condensed the idea of your paper into a single sentence, if that's short enough, then yeah, that's your time. Very good. Okay, let's keep, keep on going. We have more ground to cover. And then let's go to, to the next part. So now we have the key things there. We know what, what we know the point. We know what results do we want to put in. We have an abstract, which is the story in a miniature form. And now let's start thinking about the rest of the paper. How do we, how do we get that done? Um, the thing that I'm advocating for is to, again, have a plan because it really, really, really helps. And in an optimal setting, what you would really have is that you take all the sections of your paper and you have a plan that is at the paragraph level. So introduction, first paragraph, talk about that. Introduction, second paragraph, talk about this. Introduction, third. Uh, it's not always, it's not always necessary. For example, for methods, you may already kind of, you, you may, that, that may be so easy that you just write it out. Or for results, uh, it will sort of, um, you don't need to plan every single paragraph. You will see how it looks like when you write it. But if you can, it helps. For the intro and discussion, I think this should be always followed, that you really have a paragraph level plan, because that makes, first of all, then there's an arc, then there's a story, because you thought of the story beforehand. You, told, you thought of the story that the paragraphs tell before you started writing them. So it's easy to get more, uh, easy to read, read uh, text out of out of out of this method of work and the good thing really good thing if you do this is also that that it saves you time 
in that very often what happens is that you are writing the paper, you are interrupted, you do something else, you need to return to the paper. If you don't have any sort of a plan, it takes a long time to remember where you were. But if you have a good plan, then you can basically almost like randomly pick any of those paragraphs and start writing text because you have bullet points that tell the, the paragraph about this, that and that. So it's much, much easier to be interrupted and much, 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 much easier to, I don't know, spend extra 15 minutes somewhere writing your paper if you know what to write in there, but you don't need to spend this 15 minutes remembering that, that I'm here, where was I going? So, so this, this is very, very helpful. I use this method also for grant applications that I have a plan that, that tell this, this, this and that. And then when I go back to writing, I can immediately just pick one of the paragraphs and start start filling it filling it up good but let's let's move on so that we can cover cover everything uh let's begin with the intro so the introduction of a paper well that's the first three first minutes of star wars that's the setup that tells about the context that tells about the world that where your paper lives in and it's then it's it's much like the first first part of the abstract. It's much like the whole abstract actually, but with much more emphasis on the top. So the broad setting for the question, then the knowledge gap, the question that you are addressing, and then a bit about what you did and why how, how did you do that. I often start with a template here. So this is this kind of it takes some. It's always good if you don't have to make many decisions. I like to work that way, that I have something that I can follow. And then I can, I can sort of improvise later. I can, I can change things and I can iterate. But I, I often start with this template myself. Um, how did I come up with this template? I didn't. I mean, I read many papers and I just noticed that they follow this template. Also, my own earlier papers. That, I don't know. Did, I did write a nice introduction here. How did I do it? And I saw that this is basically how, how it goes. Of course, this depends on where you are writing. If you have, if you are doing a physical review letters, this might be too long. If you are doing something else, this might be too short, but as a sort of general guideline, it tends to work. So what does this template have? It has first a paragraph that gives the broader context. So what, what's, what's the subfield of science? What general issues are we addressing here? Uh, it's where you start with by citing this kind of key papers in this field or, or provide a lot of context through citing different different uh, papers. But it should also already kind of at least hint at the knowledge gap or the question that you are about to ask. So it's like this has been done, we know this, but this is a bit less, less known. Then the second paragraph is something where the goal is to arrive at your research problem at the end, as the last sentence. So the last sentence of that second paragraph tells that, but it's, however, this remains entirely unknown. And then the point of that is to arrive, the, the paragraph is to arrive from the broad context to the sentence that tells that, however, X is still mostly unknown. And then this far you have been talking about what others have done. So citing papers, citing discussion in the field, maybe your, in the future your own papers as well, but mainly, mainly what others, others have done. Now the third paragraph kind of reverses the point of view that we just arrived at this question. And now let's tell what I did or what we did to answer that question. So this third paragraph might begin with, to this end, we have investigated X, blah, 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 blah. That directly kind of talks to the sentence of the previous paragraph. However, we didn't, we don't know this. Now we do something about not knowing it. So it tells about your, your uh, research. What's your approach? What's the quest? What's, what's the research question? And then, one more paragraph that's kind of a quick recap of, of your results that we found out that but this and that and that and that. So this is a typical typical design that that uh, works pretty well. Uh, 
And it's there for many PNAS papers, for example. I've used that for such papers. And, and, and we, we have now, for the paper, several papers that I'm now working on, the same template is being used. And it seems to sort of, it makes routing easier because there's a skeleton that you don't you have to follow. We don't need to decide everything. And it provides the right, right things in the right order. So there's clarity, which is super important. Um, questions? or comments at this point. Okay, moving on. Uh, methods. Now, this is nowadays a bit of a nightmare because there are so many journals where you have methods at the end, but then you have to have some of the methods in the text as well, and it gets all sort of pretty complicated. Nevertheless, your methods are successful if this is, is the case that someone can reproduce your findings afterwards. First of all, this is important for the science, integrity of science and scientific methods and that, that someone should be able to check whether you are right or not. If someone, if anyone can't check whether you are right or not, then what's the point? And this is this a scientific result or not? And very, very, very often, this is not possible. When you read, I mean, probably many of you have, have the same feeling that you've read the paper and you try to figure out what it is that they've done and you try to get the details and then you see that there is not enough information, not even after reading through this 25 page essay that you could actually replicate all this. So don't be that person, be the person who actually gives out all the details, plus the code, plus everything so that someone can, can replicate your findings. Also, this has another sort of side effect that if you do it this way, then there will be clarity and clarity is the thing that readers and reviewers appreciate very very much so if you can write your methods in this way then readers can follow them and they will be happy if they can follow now some sort of some points um, schematics and figures use them use schematics I, I have not seen a paper that has too many schematics about things i've seen very many that have very, too few so do that, use schematics if you can. Always motivate your choices of methods. Even, even in the methods bit, use a couple of sentences that, 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 yeah, that motivate, why did you do this? Instead of just talking about what you did. Also, I like limitations to be mentioned early on in the paper. So if your methods can do something, but they, they, they have certain limitations, can't do something, state them when you introduce the methods. This is again about sort of honesty and reproducibility and all that. And make everything available if you can. So that's, that's a good tool to follow. And then, yeah, one more example about about clarity and about motivation. So when you start a methods section, um, it's very typical for, for, especially for early student papers, for first time writers that you just start writing about who did this. And it's also very often that, how would I put it? Young writers, think that other people know more than other people actually do and therefore it's always good to it, it's easy to kind of feel that yeah yeah i mean i've i've done this and my supervisor taught me to use this everyone knows this method no they don't i mean this is this is typically they don't so that's why it's good to tell that we pick this method because it's good for this or that or, or this is the reasoning why we do things in a certain way so this is very often forgotten but please do it it makes it makes again your reader's life easier and it makes your reviewer's life as well easier. A very typical reviewer comment from a journalist that you did this, why did you do this? Can you can you motivate it? Can you tell me why 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 does it work? So do that. Focus on that when writing already. And be nice to your reader because leather sections always have a ton of detail. So so yeah. Be nice to your readers who may be struggling with, with all, all that detail. Good. Um, moving on. Results. Now. Yes, sorry, I want to ah. ask a question before you start. Yes. Just for the method. So, so this may be also a personal question from 
my perspective. So I always struggle not to overwrite something, mm -hmm. but we also want to write the readers to provide the readers sense. So any comments on that? How to maybe avoid use the SI if there is an SI. So I, I, I think then, then if there's a lot to be written, then the best way really is to include in the methods enough so that the reader get, gets the big picture and then put all the details in the SI. Or if there is no, well, okay, there is nowadays an SI always, almost always. So there are very few journals where you can't have any, any appendix. But then, yeah, then have the details there. That would be my... my uh, recommendation because typically then you have no limit to length and then then everyone will be happy if you have every single detail there that they can follow plus all the code and and all that so for example if we mention a in the previous section what's what's our question so how much should we reference back to what are we doing how much should we Okay. Yeah. No. No. It's 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 a very good question, and it's something that has come up a lot when when, when I edit the drafts of students together with them. That that yeah. How much do I? Because then you can of course you can go over the board with this. That you motivate you kind of reiterate everything at the beginning of the math, which is not related. And so, I think the general rule depends really on the distance in the text. So if I just said something in the last paragraph. I don't need to repeat that. But if I said something like 15 paragraphs ago, if it's a long paper, I do need to recap a bit or at least provide a pointer that as we discussed in BUM, we need to do this. So, so back referencing works if there's a, there's a lot of, but if there's a long gap, but if there's no gap, then, then no need. But yeah, so this is something that's of the points that, that when editing papers with students, this is often the case. So both both ways happen. All right, good. Results. So we've chosen the results already, right? That was part of the story. We know what goes in. So this is just how to write it. So basically, what what the function of the results section is is that it gives credibility to your main claim to the point of the paper. So that's the, that's the job. You need to write it that way that you provide all the evidence for your point. But this is what we get. If you can do that in a sort of exciting way, nice. But that's the main thing is that it's kind of there's integrity. You really provide all the evidence that you that you can. Um, and this is, this is the scheme we had earlier, that you have the basics, and then you have the results that lead to your key result, then you have the key result, and all that. Uh, and very often, on this section, the planning starts with figures. If you have, if, 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 unless you, you have sort of applied mathematics paper where you would have proofs or lemmas, that would be order of presentation. But here, typically, we have figures. And typically, the first sketch of results is the order of figures and their captions. This is a good way of getting it started. So let's talk a bit about figures and their captions at this stage. Um, some pro tips, captions. You can write figure captions in many ways. And in some journals, it's very common to have, have very short captions like X as function of Y, which is kind of okay, but if you have labeled your axis, then everyone sees that already. So zero bits of extra information there. If you repeat what's, what the names of your axes are, it's much better if you can, to some extent, at least tell about the figure. So what's, what's the take home bit there? What should the reader understand? That this figure shows, figure one, uh, we show that X depends on Y in a way that's compatible with our theory, much better. So that you can actually get the point from there. And if you can actually write all the captions in this way, so that, that a busy reader could simply look at the figures and captions and forget the rest of the paper. So, okay, so this is, oh, that's the story, that's the result, the better. This is, if you look at some science and nature papers, this is the trick that many writers use there. They have very, very long captions, big figures, and you can actually get the whole story by just looking at the figures. Now, this is good in, for the following that actually, guess how many readers are going to read your paper to its last detail? 
that if you if your supervisor does it, you are lucky. I do it to my students, but not, I know that not even all supervisors read every detail of the paper. So most readers keep, they look at the intro, maybe abstract intro, figures, maybe conclusions, and those who really need to know the details read the rest. So it's good to kind of accommodate those readers by, by writing your paper in such a way that you can get the main points by just looking at the figures, looking at the captions. Great. Uh, then some sort of... <laughs> Uh, basic rules, label your axis. Uh, this feels like it's it's strange to me even need to say this, but uh, as a reviewer, I have received papers for review that don't have axis labels. Also as a supervisor for the first drafts, I all very often receive first drafts with figures that have no axis labels. And that sort of annoys me because it's very hard to figure out even that, yeah, yeah it was just a draft, we did quickly did that, but I don't understand what's in it. So, no. Always, yeah. Forgetting to label a figure's axis should be a bit like, like forgetting to put your trousers on when you leave for work. So I mean, it should it should not happen. You should be embarrassed if you do it. Put labels. Colors. Um, there's a lot of good literature on data visualization and and things like that. And one of the things that's very often mentioned and makes sense to me is that try to have colors retain their meanings. So that if you use red for this, then you use red for the same thing in the next block on the next page. If you use red for something entirely different, it's hard for the reader to follow. So it's much easier if the reader has expectations that red means. So suppose I have three data sets, then every result for those data sets would be data set one, red, red dots, data set two, blue squares, what nots. So that I retain this meaning. Then I would never use red for anything else in this paper. I would use, I don't know, magenta or orange or some, for something else. So that the reader doesn't build expectations that they can't follow. Good. Then figures in general, learn to do nice figures. That is a skill that pays off hugely. Again, this is kind of like no, okay. If figures are nice, then it's easier to read the paper. It's easier to follow. It's it makes it it makes the experience of reading your paper nicer for the reader, which is always something to strive for. Uh, the same also for the reviewers of your paper. They will be happy if the figures are nice, and there is this psychological effect that it is not about science. So I'm not sure if it should be there, but it clearly is there. That's for papers, that's for grants. If your figures look professional, but really professional, you have higher chances of getting accepted, whatever the science is, unfortunately, because this is simply how, how, how things are. The expectation that you get from looking at the figure that, that looks like a thousand, thousand dollar figure, then yes, okay, this, this, these people are serious. That's unfortunately how it is. So, how would I put it? Not everyone can afford having a designer in their team. I don't. Uh, but at least learn to use some tools yourself. So, so Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape or similar for vector graphics editing, where you can sort of niceify the figures afterwards. Uh, all those tools of, of R or ggplot to matplot everything. Learn to use them well. Learn to do combined figures well. That simply pays off. At least don't give the reviewers the possibility to kind of dismiss your work because the figures look crappy they will so don't do that do nice figures so don't do this this is an example that that is not the real example i came up with this myself because i've seen too many figures like this also from some journals to be reviewed but i didn't want to show any real figure but don't have figures like this awful colors use nicer colors or the same symbols for all graphs never do that Use, use different symbols for different graphs, even if you have different colors. Um, use big enough symbols, use big enough fonts. This is, by the way, another thing. I've never ever gotten a draft or a paper to review from a journal where you have axis font label fonts that are too big. It has never happened, ever. But very often I get this like 6PT fonts that you, you can't, for many of my, most students are not in the, but some, some students of mine who are not at least, they don't know what I'm talking about. I always correct them for this, that 
double or triple your font size, please. It never hurts to do that, that it's legible. Uh, time flies, time to move on. Uh, any more, any questions about figures? Good, let's move on to interpretation. Yeah, so, so just one, one, one bit. The, one thing about results is that what is the result? That's always a good question. Uh, you have plots, plots are facts. You have numbers, numbers depending on numbers. That's that's something. Then you those numbers can show things that are sort of easy to agree on. That 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 red dots are always above the blue dots. That's that's really a fact. You can talk about that as a fact. Now, what does this mean that red dots are above the blue dots in your graph? Then it's always good to kind of indicate the level of interpretation or assumption here. Whether blue dots being above red dots absolutely clearly uh, confirm my theory, or whether they are in line with my theory, or whether blue dots being above red dots, um, one could hypothesize that the reason might be this. Right. So indicate in your sentences the level of certainty with your results. In my view, it's always okay to speculate in scientific papers. When if you raise the flag, I'm speculating. So say in your sentence that one could speculate or one might ask the question whether the reason behind blue dots being above red dots is this. So you can do that, but always try to indicate the level of certainty. It makes the readers and reviewers life much more easy. And also do not over interpret. This is something it's a very common thing because because we are kind of told to market our papers and we are kind of many papers use big words so there's a pressure to use big words but but try to not to do that try not to over generalize that if i see this with one data set it doesn't really mean that that would be the same for every data set in the world it's for your data set then it's a good question interesting question whether it's there for all the rest of the data sets of this world right Um, one more writing tip. This is something I, I, I've done some work with people in various biomedical fields, neuroscientists, immunologists. Uh, they have this way of writing results such that you use subsection titles that are individual sub results. A bit like if, if your key result would be the title of your paper, then in the results section, you have sub results that are are like uh, subsection titles of your paragraphs. This is not always doable for something that's sort of very mathematical formulas interspersed with, it's, it's not always doable. But in some, for example, for many data science papers, this works well. So that brings a lot of clarity to the results section that if you write a sort of sub result, subsection title, explain that result, move on to the next one, use the result as a title. Good. Uh, about spent half an hour to go, so let's let's move on. The discussion. Um, okay. This is a difficult part to write, and also this is difficult. It's difficult to give any very general recommendations about the discussion section because here, if anywhere, there are really like field specific differences in the same biomedical fields, for example, you should not interpret results at all in the results section, but you should have a discussion section for each result separately, which makes writing a bit harder because there can be five pages between the result and its interpretation in such journals. What I'm talking about here is like general discussion. So, so the wrap up of your paper. So how to write that. Um, and here again the length depends a lot on 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 your chosen journal if you write for physical review letters and this is one paragraph if even that for some longer papers this might be five six paragraphs really depends if you have paragraphs to spare and then a skeleton that that i often start with myself is that first you start with a sort of wrap up uh, summary paragraph that in this paper we have shown that this and this and this in this paper we established the following three results one two three so 
first kind of yeah remind the reader that this is what we did and then maybe you start talking about each of these results or each of their implications with with single paragraphs all the doors that they open all the additional questions that they they raise so that you have one paragraph for this result what does it actually mean uh, is, is this result completely general are there some limitations are there some new questions that that uh, come out of it and then in the end you should move towards impact so why did these results matter so how is the world now a better place that we've done this what 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 should the world learn what can now change what can what can come next and then you should you should uh, end your discussion on a sort of high note a positive positive view uh, the limitations thing here and that's something that not very often in, in writing classes for it's it's one emphasizes limitations for both for say master's thesis or for papers that you should talk about limitations here and then people kind of misinterpret that that either they try to they, they fear the limitations and they never mention them or talk about limitations in a way that kind of downplays the own importance of the work i always like to think of limitations as new research questions because you can always frame them that way and that makes it much more that makes them much more sort of um what's the right word someone can act on them if 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 you write them that that way for example if if i've studied some social behavior using a mobile phone data set i've seen very clear and crisp, crisp result that yeah this is what we see social networks look like this if i have a mobile phone data set then i could write the limitations in two ways that i could say that yeah but this is mobile phones so maybe this is just phone usage patterns maybe this is not about people's real social things or i can write the same thing in a way that it would be super important and interesting to see if the same patterns can be recovered by using other types of data sets or data on other types of human interactions you see the difference you can kind of you can always use the limitation to pose a question and this is an important thing for the discussion part um, if you want your work to be cited it's good to open doors so it's good to that if you can open and propose new research questions because science is sort of a funny business we we try to figure stuff out right but if you figure out everything there's nothing more to be done so if i would in in, in any i could kill a field by writing a paper that solves all the problems in that everyone would hate me because then we can all go home there's nothing more to be done but if i write the paper that that in the discussion has 10 questions that are there for studying so other other people can go and grab those questions and stuff everyone would love them. so do that in your discussion section open doors ask questions propose projects based on your work then then that will then then you are going to have a scientific impact good uh, i think i already mentioned this template idea so recap individual issues and then the final paragraph that has kind of a positive ring to it has a take home message to it um, that that yeah for example a very good ending sentence in general that because of our results it is now possible to do something period good let's move on so that we can we can actually touch the sentence level writing a bit let's see how far, far we can get <laughs> okay we have a plan we've gone through all the sections we have gone through the figures we have an abstract some sort of a title now it's time to start writing so so i've spent now like an hour talking about planning to write and this is exactly the right thing to do when also in your project use a lot of time to get to this point and now start to write don't start it too early because it will feel painful here it's easy you have a plan for every paragraph good now the thing is and this is the most difficult thing to do this quickly so take your outline write the paper quickly like not spending time on individual sentences sort of trying not to be critical self-critical at all i know this is very difficult it's difficult for me it's difficult for everyone 
but the more you more you learn to do the, the better because it's very easy to edit text as compared to writing new text so write a lot of new text as quickly crappily as you can and then start editing it that's much faster because it's scientists are always sort of perfectionist in one way or another I and mean, we wouldn't be like this we are we are we are nerdy in that way that we can really start thinking about ah but this second word of this sentence it could be better if it would be like this or does this my first sentence make this point try to overcome that you spend too much time on individual sentences it's wasted time because you will edit them over and over again and with a high probability you're going to delete those sentences so don't do that quite quickly okay how to write now we get to this point we have still a bit of time for that um how to write this how to come up with the words now some rules to remember we have a paragraph level plan there's a reason for that plan because one paragraph should be about one thing or one topic only it shouldn't be about this and then that and that and that and end somewhere else where it started it's very difficult to read such meandering text so just like paper should have one point, a paragraph should have one point to make or one topic to discuss, not many topics at the same time. And you should make that clear to the reader early on. So the first sentences of your paragraph, you make clear to the reader that this is what my paragraph is going to be talking about. So that they don't have to wonder, that they don't have to spend their, their brain computer cycles in trying to guess what, where this is going. A very good good uh, way of writing is that if you all the time make sure that your reader knows in advance where you are going, because the science is hard enough. It's 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 too hard if they need to guess where your sentence or paragraph or paper is going. So always give them these hints. Start with sentences that tell about what the topic, and then conclude the paragraph lead to the next paragraph that's the job of the last couple of sentences and those last sentence is strong so that's something that readers remember because there's a gap before the next paragraph so you can put some sort of weighty material there now this is really a fractal like thing right because sentences work exactly like paragraphs so sentences again if in the beginning of your sentence the reader kind of get can get the grasp of where the sentence is going that's great and then at the end of the sentence, if you put weighty stuff there, then that's the one that the reader will remember because there will be a period and break after the sentence. So you can use this. And to keep your reader on the right track, you shouldn't start with difficult things that you explain at the end of the sentence, but try to somehow reverse that. Use familiar words, familiar things in the beginning and then move on to more difficult things. Think of the reader really like reading left to right, so that at all times their mental state is, is on the right, right page with, the, with what's going on in the text. Some things, try to keep your subject and verb close. Um, that, is, that helps, again, readability. It helps to understand, it helps to make text more clear. And if your sentences are short, that helps as well. That's another kind of common beginner mistake that you've somehow, we've all seen text that's very dense, and you somehow think that it sounds more intelligible if you have very many words and you have very long sentences and long paragraphs, and it kind of sounds less intelligent if, if it's short or if, if you use less words. But then if you go back to the classic papers, of your field and read them so the really really highly cited ones they are never very cryptic usually they always use short sentences they are written much more like newspaper stories than than this kind of academic prose that has has uh, 200 word sentences if you can also avoid the passive voice because it as you see in this example you use the passive voice you need more words so it gets more cluttered. There are reasons for using the passive voice. For example, if you want to say, say that it, it has been shown that something you don't want to say who has shown it, that's fine. But generally, don't try to write everything in passive. 
how to spot it that's that's a very good tip that i learned that if, if if after the verb you can you can add by zombies and the grammar is not violated then that's passive voice then then that's the way of spotting it this sentence was written by zombies something um okay so use don't use passive voice if you can avoid it use verbs that describe actions use verbs that actually do something that that describe what's going on and try to get things as short as possible but this is a good example of something that can be written in, in many ways so you can write the base a dependence between x and y this is grammatically correct but then there are many words there aren't there you can say x is dependent on y better you can say x depends on y that's far 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 better because it's somehow active but you can also say what happens which is that in this case x would draw linearly with y so then you actually know what's going on you don't hide the meaning behind words but try to condense things so that it's easier to follow great <laughs> okay then editing now you have written your paper first crappy draft in a day i hope or two days no one ever does that but still in a week so so quickly so that you have not gotten stuck on things because and this is something you'll know when you have written 10 or 15 or 20 papers that that the first draft is not going to survive you are going to rewrite many parts of it that's why it's really not it doesn't make sense to to try to make it perfect but so editing at least two passes um and here, the supervisor and your colleagues are of great help. Usually the first pass is like the structural pass. So, okay, I've written this thing. Now, does it have the right elements in the right order? Can someone make sense of it? Does it read well? <clears throat> or is there some other, some structural issues? Are there things that we should add or leave out? So that would be the first edit, edit pass. And usually someone else helps here. Is using someone else to to point this out would be very helpful your supervisor your student friend anyone so that because you uh, yeah after having written this yourself it's difficult to see these issues that okay we actually didn't mention this at all but it's crucial for the story so we should be at it and then the second second and third and fourth and fifth and so on passes are about about the details, about sentences, about you following the rules that I just mentioned. So, so try to get everything as smooth as possible with the aim of, of getting easy, um, sort of easy to understand short, simple sentences. Very often I do this together with my students. I know that this is, I'm a bit of an outlier, not all supervisors do this. What we do is that, that me and the author of the paper, and maybe if there are more, we take a big screen, or a meeting room, we sit down in front of the screen, we reserve like four hours of time, some long time slot, and we start going through everything sentence by sentence from the very beginning. First sentence, does it look good? Should it be changed? Can we cut something? Uh, then we move on and on. So I don't do this cycle of well, you know, red pencil annotations on printouts and handing back to the students. This is faster. Even, even though you need to reserve a lot of time for this, it's faster because, because we can immediately discuss points that are unclear. So what did you try to say here? What, 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 what was this? Uh, how should we change the wording here that this would make more clear? Plan? So I do this. See if you can get your supervisors or colleagues to do this with you, but sort of co-editing together in front of a screen. That's a great way of getting a finished product. And how we do this is really that once we are at the stage where this can be done. We do it. If it takes eight hours, it takes. If it takes 16 hours, it takes. And then it's done. Because we've gone through every single sentence of the paper. And then we finish there. Once it's done, it's good. And then we submit it. So there's like this final polishing pass that we always do together. With really the aim of that. Now we decide that after this pass, it's perfect for submission. No, nothing more to be done. Good. And then after this, we have a finished paper that we can we can sub questions, comments at this this stage. We still have a bit of time for the final couple of things, and maybe maybe of those we we spend some time on re reviewer comments and how to deal with them. That's probably the most important one. Um, cover letter 
sometimes you need to do that, sometimes not, um, before you submit. If you do a cover letter, then a couple of rules, get to the point quickly. Editors are pressed for time. They may have like dozens of papers on their desk. They want to quickly see whether this paper is any good and whether this paper is in the scope of their journal and is so if, if the journal has some importance criteria, then it's important enough for that journal. So they don't want to read two pages, three pages of text. They want to basically get the key point quickly and quickly be able to decide that, okay, this is a paper that's good for my journal and I'll just submit it for, for reviewing. And here you should write this in a sort of inverted order not like in science, typically, where you start broadly and just like in the abstract, where you start broadly and then finally in the middle of abstract, you the abstract, you have your key point. You should start your key point. That should be the first sentence here <clears throat> and then move on from that. But then, yeah, then let's chat a bit about use the remaining time basically on, on, on revisions and, and dealing with reviewers and, and resubmitting papers. Now, <clears throat> now here the situation is sort of really fundamentally different from someone like me who has who has uh, written a lot of papers seen all possible kinds of reviewer comments and who sort of nothing depends on whether some paper is accepted this month or the next and then if you are a phd student is your first paper and or if it's your first paper or if it's the last paper of your thesis you may really be working against a deadline uh, and you have put a lot of your effort this is this paper is yeah if it's your first then it's really your first so it, it you've put your soul into it in a way and then you get nasty comments i still remember how it feels for the first times to get really critical reviewer comments and the key thing here is that, how would I put it, this happens, unfortunately, it happens all too often um, that reviewers are critical of your paper. When you see the comments for the first time, then the typical sort of very human thing to do is that you kind of read through and you start to know, uh, it doesn't say accepting here, it's, it says like rejection or major revision or things like that and or you sort of go into a flight or fight mode of response that someone is attacking you you read through the rest of the comments focusing on the negative so seeing all the all the bad things there and then you feel like shit afterwards you feel like oh, oh this 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 is that person has destroyed me i'm nothing i this my phd will never work out all that um it's human to do that. It's, it's human to feel like that uh, if it happens. But I've never ever been in a situation where this couldn't be fixed. So I've never been in a situation with a student where finally we couldn't publish the paper, either in that journal or some other journal. That has never happened. So the worst thing that can happen is that, that this journal doesn't accept your paper or it takes more time than you thought but nothing really bad can happen even if it feels like like your life was just sort of torn apart by this review so don't work that's kind of part of the business that you get critical very sometimes very very critical reviews and then my solution here would be that first read them and then sort of forget them for a while so look at the comments let your emotions calm down, look at them again next day, day after, or whatever, and then try to be a bit more balanced. And very often then when rereading the comments, you actually start to see that it wasn't as negative as I thought. And there are things that are easy to fix, things that I can fix, and then this might work out after all. Or if it doesn't look like that, then revise another journal, but it's not the end of your life. So when bad comments happen, remember that they've never killed anyone. And all the papers have always been published somewhere. It always happens in the end. 
Now let's look at the sort of individual comments. So once you have a compound, this is the, this is the way that I typically try to deal with comments that I try to sort them into different categories. Doable comments, things that look like, okay, good, let's do that. Improve the paper, correct mistakes, make something more clear. Then sort of maybe comments that are maybe so hard to understand. That's very often the case. Difficult to figure out what is this that they want. Uh, maybe some sort of things that are a bit out of scope. Reviewer wants you to do something that's not really your paper. And then there's the sort of toxic waste bin, which is the rest of the comments, which can be utterly incomprehensible or very bad or very weird that, that can be dealt on their own. Very often we do something like I don't know Google Sheets with all the comments and then grading from red to blue, every red, red to green, what, what, what sort of level of difficulty. And then, then the next column would be that what, what will we do about this comment and then start sort of methodically taking them into account. How to, how to deal with them. <clears throat> now, well, doable comments, just do them. Good. The maybe category is something that if it has, very often it's good to make the referee feel that they have been heard. This is about humans. This is about humans who have human feelings. They have, they have comment, commented to your paper in a certain way. If you don't respond, or you, you respond like, wow, oh, that's wrong. Or, or, or if you just directly argue them, then that might backfire. Very often, a good strategy is to take them into account, see that, okay, I, have, I see that you, you, you missed this sentence in my paper, you missed this key result here, you missed this. So now, so that other people will not do this, I will, I, I, I will revise part of the paper to make this more clear. Even if the reviewer spent like five minutes and missed something blatantly obvious, change something a bit in the paper so that it, other people will not miss it. It's good to think of the reviewers as your typical readers, that they, they are pressed for time, they read things quickly, they may misunderstand things and all that. And sometimes you may need to fight or argue, especially if you have three reviewers who all suggest five new things to be included into the paper, which can't be done, otherwise you will have a 60-page paper. So you just counter argue and maybe you counter argue also then in the beginning of the response letter to the editor that that thank you the thanks for the uh, i'd like to thank the three reviewers for the comments all of them suggested five different new things for the paper unfortunately because your journal has a page limit we can't accommodate all that and then we just pick some of them so if it's impossible it's impossible and then sometimes you have this nasty category a good example, not, not nasty example, but, but an example of this category is after reading and rereading, none of the authors of the paper understand what the reviewer's problem is. This very often happens. Then this is a good strategy I learned from Felix Reed Chokas in Oxford that just interpret it in some way. So restate the question back to, because they didn't understand their own question either. So just restate the question back to them, said that we take that the referee meant that something, and then we answer that question. It works every time, because usually they were so confused that they didn't understand themselves what they were asking. So it works. And sometimes you have these more inappropriate things, like you see, someone wants all their papers cited. Always say no to those. Let, let, let the editor know. I, I really don't go into that game, but someone can kind of force you into citing their own papers. It's, it's always good to write the response in a way that, that we feel that these, these papers do not contain relevant material for them. And by the way, they are all by the bunch of same authors. And maybe, maybe you can let the editor know that this was, not, this was a request that's a bit sort of fishy, but the editor will know if the reviewer is such a thing to cite their own papers, so you can kind of flag them. So, so don't, don't go for that. We're almost out of time. Um, Good. Okay. Accept it. Great. Have a pause. So you do this a couple of times, maybe change journals, never give up. At some point, it's going to be published. Then, great. Have a party. Do the proofs that will they give you, like, I don't know, two hours of warning time to, to fix the proofs in a weekend, Sunday night. But that's what happens. And then do a bit of marketing. Marketing for your paper. <clears throat> um, if sometimes it happens that universities don't have press officers, but you have a good enough paper that actually wants should be, you should write the press release for. There's a blog post there that you can have a look 
uh, that lays down the rules and co-written by myself and one communication officer that kind of tells how to write press releases. They have totally different logic from scientific papers. You should start with the big thing and then the second biggest thing and then move on to less and less important things so that you can just use the first line of it, the two first lines of it. Great, uh, okay, I'm done with my, my content. You mentioned the book already, and you have this, this retro old first, first cover of it. It looks like this nowadays, it's a bit better. My own design, so I'm not the book cover designer, so, but, but, but it has improved slightly. Um, good, so it's there, uh, and uh, those blog posts are still up there if you want to, want to have a look. Uh, then further recommended reading, Writing Science by Joshua Zimmel. That's something that I, I enjoyed a lot. It's not like maybe the first writing book, it's the second writing book, or it's a good book to read when you've written a couple of papers already. 